Craig was a little slow getting in here this time. Yeah, he was. Well, did you pay him? N- no. Well, that's probably the problem. We don't pay him. He needs him. paid. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't know what you pay him in. We don't give him currency, but we give him beer. Oh, well, now we start handing out beer, then Bruce is going to show up. Where do you think I get the beer? Oh, that's a fair point. Uh, so we're the Grumpy Dungeon Masters, where we don't really talk about beer on our podcast. Uh, that's I'm our friend. friend. <laughs> yeah, that's our friend's podcast. You should definitely check it out, uh, Drunk with Buds. Uh, but I'm Jay, um, co-host Christopher, and co-host Christian, a.k.a. the Grumpy Dungeon Masters. All right, intro's done. Uh, Dan's not joining us this week, I think. No, he's not feeling good. Yeah, it happens. So get well, Dan. Probably because we're going to talk about Bastions tonight. and Who wants oh. to talk about Bastions? Uh, oh, are we? Sweet. Is it Bastion time? Well, uh, yeah. yeah. So we, 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 we'll be talking about the, the, the Dungeon Master's Guide. And the new one. And yeah. overall, it, it is a home run book. I I can't talk about how great I think this book is. It's a capstone to Chris Perkins's career, almost, on how he wants games to be run, especially in the modern era of games. Us old farts, we've come, we've played, we've conquered. We've got the t-shirt, we got the podcasts. We're done. <laughs> Not that we can't learn, still learn a trick or two, but this this Dungeon Master's Guide is is honestly the, probably the book I'm going to be referencing for a while. It's like, I want to learn how to DM. Where do I go? It's like, okay, well, you pick up this Dungeon Master's Guide and you go from there. And it will give you what you need to know. As somebody who has yet to actually really look through the new DM's Guide, um, I've heard what you've had to say about it. I've heard what Dan said about it, and I've heard what other people have said about it. And having seen every other DM's guide along the way, DM's guide have always generally been just very poorly laid out. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they always have that, from first edition true. through fifth edition. And first edition is usually held up as one of the best dungeon masters guides though everyone will admit that its layout and organization is a complete and utter disaster most Mm -hmm. of first edition was let's be honest yes (laughs) and second edition so much Uh, we we, we, we've we've come so far since the 70s in terms of documentation and and i can say that from like you know that's what my career was in for the longest time was documenting user guides and getting people to understand topics and stuff like that and So much has changed with how people consume and understand data that this book really kind of takes a lot of that to heart. And we get a book that's, I think, going to last a while, even when the next style changes, even when the next kind of like revolution of documentation changes. I mean, like I've been looking at it online. I've been sitting down and reading it in my hands. It's all flowing together really well. So... Not to belabor your belabor your point too. Um, I have other DMs guides from other systems. <laughs> There's much worse out there too. Oh, so yeah. yeah. But you let's let's finish finish what you were, what you were pointing before you interrupted. You well, my, my that was basically my point is that we're you're sort of basing the you know this new one off of all of the old ones, which is what you have to do, and it's uh, it's a million miles beyond what previous editions have been uh Mm -hmm. i've i've looked through it and even i agree yeah look it it looks good things are laid out better it's easier to find stuff and there's actually useful information in this one especially for new game masters which is what the dm's guide should have always been yeah and 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 again not not to say that there's nothing in there for old dms either well yeah that's where all the magic items are (laughs) well that's where all the magic items are but i was just kind of looking through my notes and stuff today because we're going to talk about the cosmology and the magic items and um the lore glossary probably in in bastions in detail today and i was just going through the cosmology and it was just really cool to just sit there and kind of go through dm centered cosmologies and learn just you know quick quick snippets of what everything is but you know like the it's like the best most tldr that you would get from 
in the Forgotten Realms wiki about something, you know? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you if you really want to dive that deeply into the cosmology, go pick up one of the previous cosmology books or go online right. and look it up. Like that, the DM's guide's not going to have a, that massive amount of information. It, it does. And, and I, I guess we can jump right into the cosmology. The cosmology section does give you enough that you can sit there and read about a plane or something and have a good idea of what's going on there so you can be well informed as a dm for that um christian if you got like the planescape or if you, yeah. if you got the dm's guy if you want to look at the, the the planescape one like how does that line up for your tastes for my taste since i am a, a stickler on the cosmology i'll say it is in okay fifth edition adaptation of the kind of standard cosmology and overview it it does some of the things that i don't like about fifth edition which it makes a lot it it takes away the uniqueness a lot a lot of the all the planes in favor of making everything generic and uniform and that part i hate and that and they kind of i don't know they 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 paint them with a with a gloss that makes it a little less quirky, a little less dangerous. Everything is still like, oh yeah, you can go have an adventure here and it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I read the I read the section for the demon web because you know my wife is so big into the drow and the drow lore. I kind of looked that up first. I was like, okay, what, what does it say about the the demon web? And it was like, oh, that sounds like a wonderful place to visit. But <laughs> it's definitely not. <laughs> yeah. No. The, so I think it as just a, an overview for here's what the planes are and here's some basic information on them. It's great. As far as conveying the like flavor of them or, or of them, it doesn't do a great job of making them. They just make them slightly different prime materials. They're like, this is a more evil one, but it's still fine. You can go there and have adventures and nothing really that bad will happen hey, to you there. I, I re- I remember when I started second edition and to go to the planes was a big deal in second ed because first off you had to cast gate or some other spell to actually get you there. And on top of that, you also had to cast a secondary spell, which I can't remember the name of. I don't have the book in front of me, but you had to cast a secondary spell just to survive on another plane. If you went to the plane of fire, you had to have elemental protection of fire or you just start burning to death from yes. being there. Yes, the plane of st- the plane of earth you would st- you would slowly start Suffocate, to petrify. Yeah. Yeah. All the planes had these unique very dangerous effects of things and 5th edition has stripped them out in all favor even, of them. Even 3rd edition had stuff like that. It wasn't Yes, it did. Yeah, uh, you know, you didn't necessarily have to cast a spell to be there uh, and survive immediately, but every other plane, the negative plane would slowly drain your strength and turn you into a shadow. Yep. Like there there were horrific effects just from being there. That's why they had to spell, and this, this spell made it to 3rd edition, but in 2nd edition and in 1st edition, you had the spell called Avoid Planar Effects. Yeah. And this was a spell that was, and this was a short-lived spell. This was your temporary spell that you would cast on yourself right when you were jumping through the portal to go, okay, well, I'm going to end up somewhere, I'm going to cast this, I'm going to see what I need, and then I'm going to find whatever spell I really need to protect us from it. And they got, like, super specific in old editions, like, you know, the plane of water was an easier one to survive. The plane of air was an easier one to survive if you could fly, you know, because they're not immediately deadly as opposed to the plane of fire where you just start burning or <laughs> the, uh, you know, some of the lower planes where like you would go and uh, like the abyssal corruption would, would get to you and magic attracted demons mm-hmm. and the, in in the furnaces of Gehenna, like, you could not cast spells that helped other people. Oh yeah, no, yeah. Sel- had, had the selfishness and like you couldn't help. So all your spells, like you couldn't heal your friends. Yeah, they, that was a thing as well. Like certain types of magic were weaker or more powerful depending on which plane yeah. you were on. And they, these are just things that are gone with fifth edition. They are even in their planescape stuff. That stuff was largely gone. So as an as a as a simple gazetteer to just give you a what are the planes of existence and what's a brief overview it's not bad it, it does lose a lot of the specialness i think 
Yeah, they probably expect everybody to have already bought Planescape uh, to have any inkling of what's going on in the planes. Well, yeah. to, to, to give it some 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 credit, okay. Um, I looked up the elemental plane of fire in the new book. Um, I'll just read the, the, the section on it here real quick. Sure. Uh, elemental plane of fire. A blazing sun hangs at the zenith of a golden sky above the plane of fire, waxing and waning on a 24-hour cycle. It ranges from white hot at noon to deep red at midnight, so the darkest hours of the plane display a deep red twilight. At noon, the light is intense. Most of the business in the city of Brass Sea Below takes place during the darker hours. The weather on the plane is marked by fierce winds and thick ash. Although the air is breathable, creatures not native to the plane must cover their mouths and eyes to avoid stinging ciders. The Yafrit use magic to keep the cinder storms away from the city of Brass, but elsewhere in the plane, the wind always blows sometimes rising to hurricane force during the worst storms. The heat, and this is underlined as a link on D&D Beyond, the heat on the plane of fire is comparable to a hot desert on a material plane and poses a similar threat to travelers. See environmental effects in Chapter 3. Sources of water are rare, so travelers must carry their own supplies or produce water by magic. Important features of the plane of fire uh, include the following. Cinder waste. The plane of fire is dominated by the great expanse of black cinders and embers crossed by the river of lava. Roving bands of salamanders battle at each other, raid Azer outposts, and avoid patrols from the city of Brass. Obsidian ruins dot the desert, remnants of the forgotten cities, and it talks about the city of Brass, sea of fire. But it does mention the heat and the environmental effects. So when you go to heat, but, but that's you, different. I know it's different. I know it's different. It does say when the temperature gets 100 degrees or higher. The creature exposed to the extreme heat uh, without access to the drinkable water must succeed a constitution saving throw at the end of each hour or gain one exhaustion level. The DC is five for the first hour, increasing by one for each additional hour. Creatures wearing medium or heavy armor have disadvantage on the save. That was me all throughout LARP this year. <laughs> <laughs> Creatures yeah, that have resistance one. or immunity to fire damage. But I, I understand what you're saying. The older ones was definitely had you just it. start taking fire damage. Like yeah. you step there and you just start and it's every round. You start taking That's... one deep fire damage around. But that because but you that... are on a plane made out of fire. It is it is the building blocks of fire. It is the primal source yeah. of fire in the right. universe. You it's step not through just a door and you're in lava. <laughs> yeah. It's not just unpleasant. It is uninhabitable for creatures right. that aren't of some elemental nature. And I want to say like that that is that is not something that, that fifth edition just got rid of. That is something that games as a whole for us has changed and gotten rid of that. The quality of life and speed in which a game can come and go and move forward with uh, is has definitely changed, especially over the last 20 years. You take a look at something like World of Warcraft that, you know, it's like, oh, we will never have flying mounts. And now it's like, OK, this expansion's all about flying mounts. We love flying mounts. Everybody has a fucking flying mount. You can do fucking flips and shit on this flying mount. <laughs> and the quality of life has gotten to the point where it's like, okay, yeah, well, now you have to spend $90 on this mount here that will give you access to the banks at all times. So if you're rich enough in real life, you can just have this nice quality of life feature where you don't have to do banks and shit anymore. It's just like gaming and gamers as a whole have shifted away from immediate negative effects that require thought and diligence. <laughs> you know? I I don't think that's entirely true because you see plenty of popular things in the style of Shadow Dark, uh, old school essentials, and the I think it's com- I think the old it's coming kind back. of games that that are still like, nope, you make a dumb decision, you suffer the dumb consequences. Yes, but I I, th- I think those are coming back, and they have terms for those. Like, you know, they call them Souls games. You know, and like, oh, this game is going to be intentionally hard. You're going to die a lot if you don't take extreme care. You're gonna die even more. This is a soul style game. Like that's a that's a, it's, a, it's a trope now in gaming. It's like those are the games that we played when we were kids, guys. And now yeah. it's like a Souls game. You know, Souls games. They never played Battle Toads. Fuck these kids. Yeah, exactly. Days, yeah. I I have heard Battle Toads be compared as like the original Souls game. I'm like. No, that was just Battletoads, motherfuckers. That's what yeah. you did for 17 hours. Uh, yeah, that was Battletoads. That that was 90 percent of Nintendo games yeah like, the la- but, the landscape of just games in general has changed so like where the f- plane of fire and even me as how i th- saw things and i doing one of the, the one doing uh larp this year uh, on the plot team 
I had a story where um, I had a Fire Lord, not that the year's done, I can actually talk about it. I had a Fire Lord trapped inside of a skeleton, okay? And they eventually, the group was able to get me back to the Plane of Fire. And so I brought them to the Plane of Fire where I could actually be away from all the negative effects that made me into a skeleton. And I could think clearly. And I would pop up there and be like, oh, this is great. Everything's fine. You all take five fire damage. Woo! Glad to be back. You all take five more fire damage. You're like, save us before we die horribly. You know, like that yeah. th- that is ingrained in us because that's that's the games we grew up in. But if I were to do that to any like modern day kid, they'd be like, Why are you picking on us, man? Why'd you send us here? Like it it's No, I don't I, think you would because the whole point was No, it wasn't I will a... because I that's what happens to me now. I but... sent someone to the city of brass and had this this it's like you need to find water quickly. You're about to die. And they're like, why would you send me here? Uh, it... You, It's all about telegraphing the danger and setting expectations. If you just suddenly do something where they have no knowledge and they have no ability to have known ahead of time, then yeah, it feels it feels kind of crappy. <laughs> but if you are going, okay, <clears throat> the pain of bass is a city on the plane of fire where everything is burning all the time. And those that are not, you know, native are constantly burning and dehydrating. And you, they know that they have to have the prep to survive. And they go, Oh, okay. It won't be unexpected. They won't feel like they're getting punished. They'll go, I received this information ahead of time and either I prepared and I, I do this and this and this to mitigate the effects. Or I do remember hearing that and I did nothing. I'm in trouble. Well, yep. it, it's it's almost like when you when you when we played WoW Classic, all right, where we would get on our characters, and, and I remember this very clearly too. Where like you start an undead, and you get to where the the undercity is, and you're like, okay, well, I want to explore around for a little bit, and then you run up to the north. You're in the low level zone, and there's a scholar monastery. You're like, why do those guys have skulls on around their names? And all of a sudden, like they're aggering from like across the across the map, and they're chasing you down and killing you. And you're like, "Well, screw that! I'm not going there." And then you go off and you go off to the eastern plague lands. Like, "Oh, this place is cool. The, the the visuals just change and everything. This place will be neat." That bear has a skull. I wonder what level that is. Oh God, it just one shot me. You know, <laughs> like now, like that doesn't exist in World of Warcraft because players didn't like the fact that they knew that that bear was a skull and it would kill them instantly. Now everything is scaled by your level. So you can go on Eastern plague lands at level four. See, it shouldn't have had a skull at all. You should have just thought it's a bear and then it murders the shit out of you and you learn. Yeah. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. Things that were you're when you take away that ability for people to learn about potential consequences ahead of time or suffer them. then Yeah. yeah, Of course you get that because you've, they've been, told and shown that everything will always be catered to them and they'll never be in a real danger the, right. the term the term is helicopter parenting yeah <laughs> so That's like you've got you've helicopter gamer to these people so that they've been i mean trust me i sure I'm... that your that your character will never be in any real danger because fifth edition does that it is extremely yes. hard to kill any character after about maybe third level and yep. I, I and I agree with you guys. I, I'm on your side with things. I think we've babied yeah. this generation too much with with gaming, uh, and it's like I said, hard games are now a trope. And I'm kind of playing devil advocate with everything that I'm saying, but I don't think that what they have here is a bad thing. That you know, not having listing all the negative effects, they they mention it in passing essentially, and I don't think that you're going to get more than that in modern in anything, D&D, on, on, no. On, yeah, you're not going to get that in a modern tabletop mm. game unless they want to put out a plane of fire book and be very specific. And they go, OK, well, if you want a more intense campaign, here's the more intense campaign. You're like, this is just what I used to run. This isn't the intense option. This is my default. Well, yeah. it's intense. Everybody I, I, now. I don't think you'll see it in modern fifth edition official Dungeons and Dragons. They have shifted away from that. I think you'll find it in third party games and for for 5e as well as other companies that are going along a more old school feel but i don't think you'll find i think fifth edition has identified a a path that they want to take and that's not it yeah 5e is the world of warcraft version of table topping that's fine you know there's a lot of people who just want that nothing wrong with it um, I, you know, we're all a bunch of old fogies yeah. here, so we're we're expecting a hardcore version of things. 
No, there's a place for like I just want to have a good time playing a, like a super heroic fantasy game, and for people that enjoy that, Fifth Edition is a great fit for that. It is. It does a great job of doing that. Like you are, you are going to be an elite hero among the realms, and you know you can kind of go into the. You're you're an action movie hero. Like you'll get hit, but you know it's always the cinematic. Like I, I get shot. You know while I'm reloading. Yep, and, you're John McClane. Like, yeah. <laughs> But you're never in true like danger of gonna you know at the end of the action movie the hero is gonna prevail and that's that's what that's what D and D is and the, it can be fun to do that sometimes and I still enjoy doing that from time to time. Oh yeah, I think yeah. we don't have the time to play the games that we used to have when we were a kid that were super hard either anymore. Yeah, they do. They're like, much faster. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we'll control up characters. All right, four of you died in character creation. Just one of you left. The bear's attacking you. That's a 75 hit. Yep. All right, there's 115 damage to you. How many hit points you got? Two? <laughs> you did. I mean, we've been kind of playing Ravenloft recently, so <laughs> that, that one does a pretty good job, even with 5e, of feeling threatening, at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I agree. That's why mm. it's... And it's secretly, guess what? That's why it's everyone's favorite. And yeah. there, there's something to be said for that too. Uh, but getting back to the cosmology and yeah, not game design. Yeah, um, yeah. It's a, it's an okay overview. I I will give it that. I th- they do mention all the classic planes. I love that they brought back the para elemental planes. Mm-hmm. Oh lord. <laughs> Those I are know, I, yeah. I know. I know. I don't. I don't hate them. I just. Yeah. I don't need them. I didn't mind. I didn't actually mind in the 2014 kind of 5e world where they just kind of had them as part of the like where the two planes meet. They weren't necessarily their own plane. They just yeah, said, that. hey, there's a there's an area where these two planes meet and we call it this, you know, right. where air and water meet. You know, you get so, the you get the land, you get the fields of ice. Yeah, and they didn't yeah, have yeah. to call it a plane of ice. It was just the icy area where the two met. I was call, fine with call, that. Call it a domain or something. I don't think it needs its own plane. Yeah. Well, um, uh, interesting. I will go. There is a there is a fairly different change here um, with the way they did the negative and positive planes. Okay. Oh, okay. Because in older editions, the negative and positive planes were part of the elemental planes. Yes. In this here, they encapsulate the whole of the multiverse like a dome, like two halves of a dome. Like one half is the positive plane over everything, and the other half is the negative energy plane over everything, and they make up they contain the entirety of the multiverse and separate it from the far realm or whatever the heck is that else is out there. I'll put the image in our podcast chat, yeah, yeah, it used to be uh that we, like the uh positive was where div- divine magic operated from, and necrotic magic came from the negative plane. And they were, you know, quote unquote, technically part of the elemental planes. It always seemed kind of a weird fit because they always uh, talked about how the elemental planes were the, you know, physical matter of the universe. But then they put the essence of life and death in there. <laughs> yeah, when, when they did, when they drew that thing up, I guess it was. I think I probably saw that first and third edition, but it might have been around before that. But when they first drew it up, they probably just didn't know where to put these things and mm-hmm. just threw them on there. And it's like, I don't, I don't hate the change. I, I, I think it's fine. I don't think it really matters with those two because those are not typically places you are going to. No. So, well, I will say though that if you fuck it up, it ruins your entire game. Warcraft. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, overall, it's a decent overview. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I like it. Like I said, there's enough there. Um, you didn't answer my question, though. Did the uh, did the uh, where is it? Planescape, Planescape, Planescape. Where it is, Planescape. Yeah, like what you read of the fire plane. Like, the, if all of them are written up like that, that's that's enough information for people to operate with and if you really really want to dive into the planes then i would suggest yeah so the, best, like, yeah. the best part is okay here it is is uh they have sigil city of doors as its own realm okay yeah and then yeah. they say if you want to learn more buy our book planescape adventures in the multiverse <laughs> of course fantastic <laughs> i mean hey self-promotion it's fine it's in their own <laughs> stuff so 
Yeah, but I do I do like that they went back to mentioning in there like in older editions. So I'm glad that it's there. It's a like I say, it's an alright overview. They do they do give you the layers of each of the planes, which is nice. Even though there's not a whole lot on them, it, but it does tell you the name and give you like a one sentence description. Does it give you all of the layers of the abyss? No, no, <laughs> they never have. And they never should. I agree. They never uh, should. They it's give the- they give all the main ones. So they got infinite portals, Asgarat, Demon Web, Gaping Moth, Thanatos, the Slime Pits, the Death Dells, and the Endless Maze. There, yeah, they give you a few. That's enough <laughs> to work with. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's all the that's all the main ones, you know. It's not, but. Uh, I mean, it's all the main ones in fifth edition. I really do like the picture of of uh, the demon webs that they that they added there, because that's not what that's not what I always thought the demon webs would look like. But so it's really cool to see that artwork. What does Um, it look like? I haven't seen the the picture, so I'll also put that in our podcast chat and discord. Ah, That could be useful Mm. because I have read novels where they were in the demon webs. So I have a pretty good understanding of what that place looks like. It's uh, it's really kind of cool. So like if you picture a giant like spider cocoon. Yeah. And then in the cocoon you have like ships and buildings and castles that have all have like fallen in and gotten caught through their portals. Um uh the, the, a couple of the sections are more detailed out, like the demon webs are, um, versus like the slime pits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. but it's Overall, mostly just because of how popular Loth is. Yeah. Uh, clearly. Overall, a pretty decent overview of them even if it's it misses the mark on a little bit of the flavor but it's a good overview with enough for you to easily work with if you want to use them in your game and pretty much just it was this whole chapter this whole section was written by james wyatt ah. yeah yeah I, pretty much yeah. he was contracted to to write that and it's like hey you just have all of this so he just went to town that's the best way to do it like hey, if you're just having a chapter written just have one one person. Yeah, I mean, you might have a secondary writer, but you need one person who's responsible for it. Yeah. I will say, I did hear him talk about it, and when he talks about it, he mentions some of the old, like, Planescape and old edition stuff, so he knows the stuff, and it's there, it was there definitely in the back of his head as he was writing it out. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of feel like that, that uh, he probably wrote twice of what's actually got published a lot probably hit the cutting room floor or got yeah. edited down a little bit or It'll, maybe he was just that good and kind of wrote it in one pat one one shot might, but might be I, it. they might throw it in another book later on yeah that's why i'm very yep. interested with the, the first like 2024 release being the forgotten realms campaign setting book and, like what's in there and like what's it's going to be yeah. is it just going to be an update with the same information or are you going to have a really big nice like tome to work with for the Forgotten Realms. Is it going to cover more than just the fucking Sword Coast? I don't know. Uh, no, yeah. Said it was. yeah, it definitely will. <laughs> like, yeah, so like, but they could they could say that, that that it will, and like, oh, this is the Sword Coast Adventures Guide. Okay, great. Cool. The Sword Coast. Here's the... I have the I have the fourth edition Forgotten Realms campaign guide. It's just the Sword Coast. So I don't know. I'm no, they mentioned some of the details. They they mentioned that they were going to kind of give you an overview of things, and then they were spotlighting, like, I think they mentioned, like, six places they were spotlighting. And all, I think only Baldur's Gate is on the sword, is the, one of the sword coasts. Yeah. They mentioned the Moonshay Islands. They mentioned, uh, was it Am or Kalimsham? Yep. Uh, the Dale Lands. Or... All of the good places. Did they mention Cormir, perhaps? Uh, Mulholland. They, they didn't mention Cormir or the old empires area. Uh, so, but they did mention like the kind of the Dale lands and then the, I think they're going to do, uh, what's that? What was that ruined city with the mythal? They mentioned like an elven settlement about, around a deep. Oh, uh, Mythdranor. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're going to do some Mythdranor stuff. I, lo- I actually have that box set from Second Ed. It's so much good stuff in there. Yes, yes, it is. What I really kind of hope they do, and I know they're not going to do this, but I hope they reference the Ed Greenwood books that are on DM's Guild right now. I mean, you know, because be, yeah. I mean, like you don't like for me, it's like you don't need to talk about Thay when Ed Greenwood came out with the the book Thay Land of the Red Wizards not too long ago. You know, yeah. like almost like and they have mentioned stuff on DM's Guild before. Like I feel like. 
almost like they can just say, hey, you know, we're not going to cover Thay. Here's what Thay is. Here's, a, here's the thing, though, in like the, the previous core books, uh, like the Forgotten Realms third edition one, they didn't talk that much about Thay either. Yeah, the idea no, was uh, all the idea was always to keep Thay a mystery. My 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 yeah. what I was what I'm trying to say is like okay, I have I have the three Ed Greener books here. I have Rashomon, the Border Kingdoms, and Thay Land of the Red Wizards. Right. So none of them need to be covered in this, right. in any I, real detail. They didn't mention that they were that those were any of those were spotlight areas. I think that right. they'll probably be mentioned in their like Gazetteer of the Realms kind of section. But but will but will they reference the the actual like like I said I th- I hold these as basically being like the books now if I want to look look up stuff about the yeah. Rashomon you know yep yeah we'll so see. I I hope they do you know it, it would right. make sense if since he's still under all these NDAs and shit <laughs> well, <laughs> they, back to the they, GMG yep <laughs> yep hey they're still paying him so. Yeah. All right. All right. So, what, what's the next chapter since we're done? The next is treasure. Treasure. So, treasure is treasure is treasure. I we're not going to go over the individual items. Um, XP to level three went through every single item. Watch his video on YouTube if you want to see what all has changed. Um, they basically did the same thing to the classes to the magic items. They kind of rebalanced some things and made some things more in line with other things. Um, a good example of that would basically be like the uh, arrows of slaying are now ammunition of slaying. That way now you can make it any ammunition type that you want. Bullets. And, <laughs> yeah, our bullets, yeah. And uh, if you want to, there's a table where you could roll on it to say, okay, this is a this is a random ammunition of slaying. That's a crossbow bolt that slays giants. And Move on from there. So they've like streamlined a lot of things. They made a lot of uh, items work. They added in all the magic items from the uh, D&D cartoon show are now officially in the game. Yep. Um, which is amazing. We kind of talked about that before. Um, your standard talking about how uh, things are, what the rarity is, how much value you give to them, and how to give them out as rewards. Um, and that's kind of the only real thing that I wanted to talk about was they, they actually did have a much better price guide for magic items. Yes. Um, cause you can make magic items now. And I guess that's a big thing to talk about. Uh, yeah. yeah. I have some, some thoughts. Well, let me go over my, my, my thing real quick yeah. and then we can uh, hit that. Um, So it talks about everything. So when you talk about rewarding magic items by level, it has a chart in there where it says, hey, if you have characters that are tier one, tier two, tier three or tier four, which is the same tiers they use for Adventures League, um, this is how many magic items they should have or you can award in a setting and in a full adventure. So for tier two, which is levels five through ten, um, they should have 10 common items and 17 uncommon, uncommon items-ish. Okay? Uh, if you're playing level 17 through 20, which is tier 4, they shouldn't be getting common or uncommon items at all. They should be getting rare items, which they should have 5 of. Very rare, which they should have 11 of. And legendaries, they should have about 9 of. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much I like that chart. Wait, wait. Le- how, 9 legendary items by when? By its tier mm-hmm. four, seventeen to twenty. Yeah. Uh, Never mind the fact that you can only attune to three items still. Yeah, not nine well, this, legendary this is, this is items. For a party or for this a is for a party. party. This is a four party. My okay. players might my, my my players might have one legendary item by that level. <laughs> yeah, I I think that they, I think they always have, especially in fourth edition. Um, in fourth edition, you had to have magic items. It was built into um, their challenge rating. Yeah, yeah, the challenge rating of the creatures. And I hope they didn't do that this time, but it feels like they did. Where like when you hit level five, you need to have your magic item. And we kind of feel like that now. But that's just because we're good players, too. We know that, hey, shit, everything's going to be like resistant to non-magical attacks. So we need a magic item. Let's go get our moon swords at level one, you know? Yep. And we'll be fine. So I don't know how much I like this. I don't like having a lot of items 
in my game. I like having, I like players making items or earning items that are really good and leveling up with them. So it, it, it it's, it's not bad. It's just, I don't think that this specifically is good for me. Um, but I like, I like players having magic items. And they have a nice little table where you can track everything. Um, yeah, and... I have I have a lot of concerns with something like that because it is a rookie mistake that I still see. Um, actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and talk about it. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we have a guy, one of my players who's been DMing for a little bit now. This is the first time he's ever run a campaign. He's running a homebrew. We've been having a hell of a good time with it. But as I've been playing for so damn long, I can spot the rookie mistakes that he's making along the way. And one thing he did this last game session was hand out way too many magic items at one spot. Uh, Like every single person there got really good magic items. We're fifth level. (laughs) You know, and I, I got a staff that is more or less the equivalent of the staff of the Magi. Not quite that powerful, but pretty goddamn close. And it was, it's this thing of he, he's never run a campaign before. He doesn't know not to do these things. He had these cool magic item ideas in his head and he just wanted to get them into play. Mm -hmm. But now that's going to force him to have to ramp up all of the encounters because of it. Yeah. And he, he, I don't think he realizes that yet. He doesn't really listen to the podcast. So it, it might take a few game sessions before this sort of comes back to bite him in the ass. Yeah, I mean they they do they do talk a little bit about like how many they should have, but it's it seemed high those numbers from what I just heard. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, so basically, magic items awarded by, by the level table show the number of magic items a D and D party typically gains during a campaign, totaling to one hundred magic items by level twenty. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe scrolls and potions included yeah that could be the only thing is i think they do kind of count scrolls and potions as part of that so sure if you're carrying around a bunch of potions and stuff like healing yeah. po- I, I hand out healing potions liberally so sure it's in, it then it says player wish list encourage your players to keep a wish list of magic items they hope their characters will find in the course of the uh, campaign no if you no. want to award a magic item but don't have a specific magic item in mind you can pick an item of a Appropriate larity from your player's wish list, and this is the issue that I've run into. And this is an issue oh, that I, I hate. That. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't like wish lists. That's what we had to do with fourth edition because we needed certain magic items for certain builds to work. So it became like uh, my 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 favorite example is my half Earth Elemental Warforged. I was a barbarian that was basically built around control of the battlefield. So in order for me to have control of the battlefield and make sure I had appropriate defense because I was a barbarian, I needed to get a kunai with chains that <laughs> was lightning. And then with that, I could use my whirlwind abilities to mark all the enemies around me and knock them prone and pull them closer to me. So pretty much I would just basically, I, ta- I was playing the tank. I'd get in there, whirlwind, pull them in, knock them down, mark them. So if they try to attack anyone else, I could hit them or propose uh, oppose disadvantage. Uh, and I could control the bad guys on the field to make them focus on me. Sounds and like it, a really cool MMO. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what it was. It was fun. I enjoyed playing the character. I don't have any gripes about it. It worked for that system. That doesn't work for 5e. And I kind of feel like if, if we're counting potions and magic scrolls, like that's just weird. I don't know. It, this this is the part where it looked like somebody was holding Chris Perkins's family hostage when he was like, <laughs> "Yeah, players can look at the DMG, and so maybe players want to buy their own copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide so they can see all the magic items and they can have wish lists that they can tell the DM, or they know what they can craft so they can have goals to craft that specific magic item." <laughs> and we, it used to be, it used to be that you would never hand your players the DMG. Oh, they no. didn't, they didn't need to know what magic items were existent because it was always a surprise when you would go in there. You would find something, and finding something, finding out that it was magical, and then identifying it was part of the whole like exploration loop of 
getting a cool thing and discovering it, not, well, I put this thing on my wish list and the sword's a little red, so it looks like that vampiric sword I've been eyeing for, you know, since I was first level. Like that, that is just a whole, that's not the kind of game I want to play. I love yeah. the, the, the thrill of discovery. And I think you rob your players of that when they have a wish list because a wish list also creates a expectation, right? If you're telling your players to give me a wish list of magic items you want, there's some sort of expectation of, well, if you're asking for this, I should, you know, know that maybe not everything on this list, but I should know at least some of the stuff I'm going to find is going to find my way to me. Yeah. Um, one thing that I really like, and it's with the old uh, Dungeon Master's Guide, is, and I'll pull it up here in a second, there is a set of tables for awarding loot by uh, tiers of play and everything. So if I'm doing individual treasure, there's uh, tables for that. Then they have treasure hordes, which are basically for your group. And that's kind of what I focus on. So my group right now is level 11 to 16. So I have one of the players roll on the on the table. Let's say I get a 78, okay? Uh, look up 78, so I get the roll. They get, let's say, uh, five 750 gold uh, pieces in art objects, and then I roll once on magic item table F and once on magic, and 1d4 times on magic item table G. And then I let the players roll to see what they get, okay? And I don't really care what they get, because to me, it's, it's random loot. If I have specific loot I want to give out, like I gave out the... Staff of the Magi, or the robes of the Magi, whatever it is, and the Staff of the Archmage, or whatever whatever they are, I forgot. Because Manshoon had those items, so when he put them away, of course your players would find his items that he would have. So they found a bunch of Ion Stones and a bunch of his items that came right off his character sheet, but they also found other loot that he had there, and that was randomly rolled. This does not exist. These random loot tables do not exist in the new DMG. Everything is labeled and organized by um, what the actual item is. So if you want to get ran a random magic item, okay, you basically have to decide whether it's going to be common, uncommon, rare, very rare, or legendary, and then they have a D100 table for that. So yeah, that's a, I agree with you. That's a big miss. The system you're talking about there, where is a throwback to old editions of D&D. In old editions of D&D, in the monster entries, it would tell you what treasure type they would have, and it would be like type F or type 2B. And yeah. that would tell you in the D&D what table to roll on because that was meant to be randomly generated. So you would then go and roll that treasure table for whatever thing and find out what it was. Yeah, but you you're all, you, finding you, out at the same time as your players. Yeah. yeah. But players also got XP for treasure, so... Yes. Yeah. So I really I really feel like this is a miss. I, I really like that the tables are li lined up by, you know, common, uncommon, rare, very rare, legendary. I like that. I do. Oh, yeah. I just also wanted to have the individual and treasure hoard tables, too. So because now I can't I can't roll for treasure tables anymore for uh, for rewards. I think your I cat. Mean, I, I, I want to say something. I think your cat is breathing into the microphone or something. He's snoring. I keep, yeah. I, I keep hearing something going on. I thought you were maybe messing with a leather chair or something, and then I realized no, it's just your cat snoring. Hold on. Let me move. The, let me move the mic closer. <laughs> Shh. Yep, that's what I was hearing. I have a really good mic. Let's pick up the cat. Yeah. Hey, he, anyway, back, he's, back just, to he's, just, he's just in my arms all asleep. Yeah. Back to our discussion. <laughs> so there was uh, there was one thing I did like. I do miss the old tables because I, I miss that kind of old school kind of like, what does this thing have? I don't know. Let's everyone find out at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like this random thing they threw in here of, uh, hey, what? What what might happen if you mixed more too many potions together and dr or drink oh, too yeah. many potions? And there's a table of like random effects because mixing magic potions is not a good idea. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it. people people have that uh, have made those and put them up on uh, DM's Guild. Uh, yes. I, I, I like that 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 was just a thing. I like that they have trade goods in here too, and like explain like how much one piece of ginger or a goat is. 
Yeah, but that could have been in the player's handbook. Yeah. That didn't yeah. need to be in the DM's guide. Player, no, no, no. Player, players are the ones who are going to want to do stuff like that or with right. things like a that. Player, the player needs to come to me and goes, hey, I need to get a goat. I'm just a goat. They don't need a... to come to you. They could have just looked and said, okay, a goat is two gold. I go and find a merchant. That way, you know, they, they have to then haggle. They don't have to... They don't always have to go to the DM's guide to find the cost no. of a fucking chicken, you know? No, 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 no. I think the cost for a trade good item needs to be hidden to the DM. Nah. Like, I I need to know whether or not, you know, okay, I know a goat costs one gold, okay? Um, my players don't need to know that. They don't need to know. Or maybe if they're a rogue, or maybe they, they would. They, the they probably background. would. They probably would know how much a goat cost back then. I, I don't know. If they were, if they had the merchant background, then yes, I would say that they would, they would know. I would let them know, say, hey, you normally know a goat goes for a gold, and he's asking for two gold. That's a lot. <laughs> so, like, like I, I think it's very, I think it's better in the DMG than the player's guide. I, I don't want them shopping for goats. I don't want them going, hey, I got a hundred gold. I'm gonna buy a hundred goats. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna buy every war dog in this town. <laughs> I to get through some dungeons be like, all yeah. right, I the first goat in. How far did it get? <laughs> uh, it's, it's no longer the weasel test. Now it's the goat test. Yeah. Yeah, because pigs are three gold a piece, and that's way too expensive to trigger oh, a yeah, trap. Yeah. What, what's the cheapest animal in there? You should buy those uh, if you're trying to test for traps. A chicken is two copper pieces. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You get to just they'll have never, Yeah. They'll hire never you. Get where you want. That's, uh, that's probably true. Plus, they can fly over traps. Yeah chicken would work so i what i also don't like in the magic item section is crafting magic items <laughs> so yeah let's talk about that well, we've crafting talked about it already before but all right let's yeah i don't want to get into it you know, other than i say i don't like it it reminds me of the nonsense where you would spend whole sessions in, in third edition playing merchants and magic because all your characters would be crafting all the all these ridiculous items to get through encounters and fights and and it, it just it was pointless and it, I, again it takes away from the i the think that's fun. something that you set up in session zero though so i I've, I've talked about it on here before i fucking love 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 making magic items in dungeons and dragons i always have i always will i am also in agreement with you on that christian though i might want to make magic items i do not want to take an entire game session figuring out how to make magic items and doing all of that making magic items i'm glad it's in there it should be accessible but it should be a in-between game thing you know you well, don't want to you don't want to spend more than 10 minutes on it we'll wait till I we think, get the bastions i think that's yeah. where bastions kind of come in yeah um, oh well let's do it then well <laughs> but, real quick but, on the my, making my, magic my, items like i i get it i i don't I'm fine with players being able to craft every magic item that, that exists. Um, I, I I did a little bit in my current campaign. I was like, hey, but the guy was like, hey, if you're about to go fight a bunch of demons, if you find a chain devil, harvest some of his chains and bring them back to me. I can craft you something that will help you out in your in your journeys yeah. in the future. Like I had to give that out as an NPC. It's a side quest. And if you complete it, you get a magic item like I'm, I'm fine that- with that. That is cool. See, that adds to the story. That, that that's a quest adventure. for that's a quest with payment, right? Yeah, that, but it's also a problem. Even if the crafting had into it of some that added to the core task of you are adventurers going out in the world to do stuff, that would be cool. But this doesn't. It's just hey, make a couple of dice rolls and spend this much gold. Yeah, like if I if I kill a green dragon, okay, um, and I immediately get accosted with oh okay so we killed the green dragon um star harvest that fucker i want its teeth i want its scales yeah 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 yeah. so that's gonna happen and as as a dm i'd say i don't know what you guys will get off this dragon you've told me that you will harvest it go ahead and give me some survival checks to see how well you harvest it yep and i will research and come back with an answer later and then from whatever i decide they'll that will happen as it is if you can make a really cool item with some green dragon scales that i don't know about well guess what you're gonna get that really cool item made of green dragon scales like you know maybe i'll have an option for them or or something i don't know um so i don't know like 
for me and my games, I don't want people just going, okay, let me see the magic item crafting book and let me just go to that. No. But I know there's a lot of players that do like that. Our good friends, uh, Lloyd and Mike, love that shit. So I'm glad these rules are in there for them. <laughs> Would I ever do that? I mean, if I'm running a game for our friends Lloyd and Mike, yes, I will be running a game where I'm like, okay, here, here's the magic item crafting list that you know of. If you find other recipes in the future, you can learn them and do stuff. I mean, that's that's how he plays the LARP. You know, that's just what he is. I mean, that's that's what I like doing at LARP too. You yeah. Know, not, not necessarily making magic items, but I love casting crazy ass formal rituals with things that aren't supposed to work and right. see what happens. And I can tell you, in our Star Wars game, there were many a session where I sat there and didn't say a single word the oh, entire yeah. time because they just decided to go shopping and crafting all the time. And they had a fucking blast. And I'm glad they had a blast. It was fun being there. <laughs> yeah, that that is one of the things that drove me away from that game, though. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I, I think it's definitely to the person, to the individual. Like, I think it's something you set up at Session Zero. If your group wants to have this... It's definitely there, but I definitely proceed with caution because then you don't want them going to that wish list and going, I want to make this. I want to make that. And then I need to make this or else my fighter's not going to work. Your fighter doesn't need that to work. Yeah. If I, as a player, I don't want to make a plus one sword. Like if I'm making something, I want to make something awesome. Uh, like, the, you know, we're, we're just talking, we're just talking about a green dragon. I want to make dragon scale armor out of that. You know, people don't I just wish- have that. Yeah, I wish it was more of uh, instead of hey, you're gonna craft one of these items that we've already created in the book. It was uh, here's a bunch of tables, and when you go to craft something, you're gonna roll the tables and see what you made. Sure, there are that. there are some some rules. If I can find it here again. There are uh, some stuff about like hey, here's some tables of random items, special features, or yeah, history and stuff. It's it's decent. And I kind of wish they leaned into that, to, that when you're crafting something, you're not going on a shopping trip to craft the magic item from the DMG. Is You craft things when you want to craft something that is unique. Yeah. And then it's going to turn out like random. And maybe you can, maybe I like if you, hey, if you spend, you know, special things instead of gold, you can make a re-roll on a table or you can make an additional roll and that kind of thing. And that gives you some interesting things to do. And then you're not just going on a shopping lip to, to optimize a build. You're doing it because yes. you want to make something fun and you kind of want to see what happens just as much as anyone else. And it's there for the Again, you're still getting that sense of discovery because you're going to be like, what exactly am I making? I know I'm trying to make some sort of staff or some sort of green dragon scale armor, but what will it do? Let's find out. Right. And and there may be some set effects. You know, okay, it's green dragon armor. Uh, Maybe you have resistance to poison. Uh, But at the same time, you're still rolling on the chart. So you might get positive effects. You might get negative effects. You might get both. Yeah. Yeah. I I like the idea of there being sort of a randomization as to what you're creating. There might be uh, some limits on it. You know, once again, you're still making armor. So it might be armor effects, but. Yep. Yeah. That would have been a much better system. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea. The, but that's only for artifact level weapons. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> but those tables he talked about, again, it's, it's just artifact level weapons. So like... Uh... Yeah, that's my other issues. They they have a lot of cool artifacts in here, which is great. I always love to see the classic artifacts that you want to see in here. But the problem is... I noticed no one, the, hand, the hand and the eye were back. <laughs> yeah, no one plays D&D to high enough level to where you ever want to give them an artifact because, like, by that point, your game is... I mean, occasionally, sure, you'll play high-level D&D, very occasionally, but for the most part, that means those are just things that sit in this book and never see the light of day. Wait, the hand and eye of Vecna are in the book? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Me and my buddy Mike were Fucking looking at him the other day. Uh, hey, hey, who knows what happens at the end of Eva Vecna, you know? I know what happens at the <laughs> Eva Vecna. It, it's not, he doesn't lose his hand and eye again. Well, they're in the book. Where? Because they've always been in the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Back they've by. always been there. Wait, what's it under? I just see... I don't remember. We looked at them the other day in the, new, in the current, like the brand new DM's guide. Eye and hand of Vecna. 
Let's see. It, and it's a, it's its brand new hand and its brand new eye. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> he doesn't. Uh, I think we I think we flustered Chris. Uh, <laughs> no, they don't even follow their own fucking cannon. What the fuck? Oh my god. On that note, uh, you two oh. keep talking. I will be right back. You're gonna have to edit this out then. Nah, no, I know. I'm leaving this in here. You you guys carry no. on about no, that. Right, right now, this conversation that you're leaving, you just edit that out. No. <laughs> be right back. Uh, yeah. Vecna wow. was a mighty wizard who, through magic and conquest, forged a terrible empire. For all his power, however, Vecna feared death and took steps to prevent his demise by becoming a lich. A treacherous lieutenant named Cass brought Vecna's rule to an end in a terrible battle. Of Vecna, all the remains were one hand and one eye, grisly artifacts that still seek to work Vecna's will into the world. The high and hand of Vecna are separate artifacts that might be found together or separately. The eye looks like a bloodshot organ, torn free from the socket. The hand has a shriveled left extremity. Um, tuning to the eye, properties of the eye, tuning to the hand, properties of the hand, casting, eye spells, hand of Vecna spells, destroying the hand and eye. He, he doesn't, oh God. In fourth edition, okay, Christian. All right. Assume it's just you. In fourth edition, all right. Uh, a Sarak got a hold of the hand and eye of Vecna. All right. Okay. And started causing problems in the multiverse. Okay. Uh, there's a really good book. Um, I don't have it handy, but essentially it's a remake of the Tomb of Horrors for fourth edition. All right. And in that, basically, a Sarak has cleared out the Tomb of Horrors because too many people came it was just an attraction that's why i made the tomb of refurbishment you know that's that's where i got the idea so canonically the tomb of horrors was looted too many times and it became too popular it just became a joke and sarak hated that so he got rid of it so when vecna comes looking for a sarak the first place that he looks for is him in the tomb of horrors and he finds that it's completely empty and you as the players basically follow vecna's terror through the place all right at the very end, he left traps. Vecna left traps for a Sarak, where he then had to fight the Avatar of Orcus and the Avatar of Tiamat at the same time. That's at the very end of Two of Horrors in 4th edition. Wow. So, oh, if you can survive wild. that, you then chase uh, a Sarak and Vecna around for a little bit, until eventually you find Vecna standing over a defeated Sarak, where he's got his hand and eye back. And that's the last you heard of Vecna until Eve of Ruin. Okay, and then Vecna had his hand and eye back, and he's casting that spell that's basically rewriting the whole multiverse and turning it into an evil wasteland. And then you got to build the rod of the seven parts and get tricked by Cass, and he takes the rod and tries to shove it up Vecna's bum hole. And when you defeat Vecna in the book, it's a surprise that was just Vecna at his least avatarness. And most of his presence was in his hidden realm, you know, casting his spell. And you just stopped it from being anchored into the material plane, essentially, and you stopped the spell. So you never actually really fought Vecna in the Eve of Ruin. You just basically beat up his avatar, stopped the spell from being cast, you stopped his concentration, and everything was said and done. So... How does he then fucking lose his hand and eye to have it be listed in a stupid fucking list again? <laughs> because the DOG does not respect canon or anything because it is just the generic rules for the base game and it doesn't it doesn't care about any of the adventures or any of the things that have gone for it. It's yeah. there because the hand and eye of Vecna have always been artifacts that are out there for you yeah. to be able to find in in the lore in, in you know in all the editions of D&D. Yeah, the book Listen. of e the book of evil it's the same thing. It's in every edition even if it's in modules or adventures. It okay. Doesn't so change I anything. I I could buy that. I could buy that as the Correct. appropriate answer and I do buy it as a outside of this caricature that I am as a grumpy DM, I do buy that as an answer and I get that. However, <laughs> However, okay. you're How, a grumpy DM. How, no, however, this is my sit, sit point. 
is then the artist, the the artist that was that drew the hand and eye. There's not an issue with how it was drawn. Well, there is an issue with how it was drawn, but it's not the artist's fault. They were not given the the proper information to draw the hand and eye. But because Vecna is such a huge entity, he kind of exists outside time and space. Okay, so the Vecna that we fought in fifth edition could technically be him at his prime or him at his future prime. Okay, but when Cass defeated Vecna and tore his arm and eye out and left just those parts that remained, they did not have the gold trim and the gold uh, gilding that he has in his current 5e form, leading most people to think that this Vecna is actually one from the future incarnations of Vecna and not the weaker one. The weaker Vecna had a very different look that's been very set in stone with the black robes and the purple and everything. So... The Vecna eye in hand here shouldn't be with the gold gilding. It should be with the old school gilding or the old school coloring and everything that he had from before. And there were models of that that just came out and published and little statuettes that you could buy. If those were the pictures that I saw here, I'd be fine with just like, oh, we have to include the hand and eye of Vecna because they always exist throughout time and space. Cool. Got it. Whatever. Awesome. But that's the new hand of Eye of Vecna. So they're that's a problem. The new, they're using the new 5th edition art style. That's why. Right. But, the, but I'm, I'm saying that's the problem. That's what, that's what turns, turns us all topsy-turvy. As that means that he no, was not defeated. not all. Just you. It means that he was defeated twice. And in both times, some moron left his hand and eye. <laughs> I don't know. Either way, the, the hand and the eye are in the book. I don't care about what the art is. So. Listen, I'm going to cry about this later. <laughs> I did actually see some 5e new art that I like, though. The uh, the DM screen actually has really good art. We'll get, we'll get to the DM screen a little bit later. Yeah, yeah we'll, right. we'll save it for next podcast or whatever. We're already over an hour now. So. Yeah, we oh, do have magic as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, 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 yeah, we still have other stuff to talk about. All right, let's get into Bastions real quick. Tell me why Bastions are good or bad, Chris. I think Bastions are boring. Not that not that the idea of them are boring. It's just that I don't have a desire to play with a Bastion at all in my game. I like the idea of building a strong holdout. I think that's cool. Uh, I enjoy that, and I enjoy players who enjoy that, and that's great. I, as a player, playing Thaladred the Fighter, <laughs> don't give a shit about uh, maintaining a Bastion. I want to get out there and hit things. So if there's ways that I can make cool things to go out there and hit things, it's just an extra chore. Um, and right. I kind of did a quick read-through of all of them, I didn't see anything that really popped out as being great. The things that were great were level 13s and 19s. And as we've always said, no game really exists at that level. So yeah. I, I just, I, I think it's, I, I think it's good for fifth edition. I haven't seen strongholds and followers by MCDM, so I can't compare it to that. I don't think that this is bad in any way, shape or form. I just don't think it's something that I'm going to use. I will try it out once or twice to see if it actually does resonate differently. There's going to be a lot of great. Um, it has a lot of room for expansion in, in future books, you know, like if they were to do ever do like another like. Um, uh, what's the Eastern Kingdoms one where it's the, like the Japanese soldiers and whatnot. Like if they were to ever come up with like a plane like that, like having. Oh, OK, better idea. If they bring, go back to the fucking Ravnica. You know, and having a Bastion at Bastion Ravnica would be really cool because then you have to bring in the guilds and shit like that. Like, there's a lot of room. They left a lot of room for players to really play around in a nice, in another nice big sandbox. And I like that aspect of it. I don't think it's a sandbox that I want to play in, but I think the sandbox that they have set up for them is going to be good. If not now for some people, it'll definitely be good in the future for other people. Is the thing in there beneficial for everything? Who's really to say? Like I said, it's not for me. But, you know, I liked uh, I liked uh, Troll School Manor a lot. 
in uh, Waterdeep Dragon Heist. That's kind of like what a Bastion would be. So I would tailor some of the Bastion stuff to that, you know, and just say, okay, cool, you're building your medical hut out. Well, you can have the, um, there's a medicine one or something like that. I think, um, like you can build, you can build that area out, and you get those benefits. So it's it's nice that I can then point to players and say, hey, you have these basic facilities, you have these special facilities, um, and. I figure that I, I expect bastions to very much fall by the wayside. Uh, I, there will be some campaigns where they get used heavily, but the vast, vast majority of them, especially the written campaigns, yeah, they're they're just not going to get used at all. Again, I go back to our friends Mike and Lloyd. Mike and Lloyd will eat this shit up. <laughs> you yeah, know? I I think it's good that it's in the DMG because then it's there's no obligation for it to show up for players mm -hmm. i like that it it kind of exists it's a th you know in the older editions of D, D, it used to be when you hit whatever level it would just tell you ninth. hey <laughs> yeah nice level hey if you're you know whatever class you are you get these amount of weird followers that just sort of show up and start following you around you're famous they, yeah <laughs> you're, you're you're a, like you're a fighter so you attract a band of mercenaries that follow you and you can establish a keep you know if you're a cleric you bring you get scribes and acolytes and Wizards get, you know, apprentices and thieves yeah. attract ruffians and other stuff to form a guild with. And I and I go back to the Acquisitions Incorporated book, which essentially was the Bastions or Strongholds book for original 5e, you know, with all the 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 uh company positions and the different kind of hirelings and stuff that you could get. This that handled it really well. Like I would rather run Acquisitions Incorporated um style company over a bastion for my players yeah if i'm ever go ahead no go ahead Jay. i was just gonna say if i ever use the bastions I, I probably won't use the bastions i would more likely just you know fall back to some other books that i've got and just let players who really want to build themselves a goddamn keep yeah yeah like Hi, higher followers do do all that stuff like i'm good with that but i don't know that i would ever utilize the actual bastion method of doing things like i think I, you I, would need to, to be playing a specific type of game for this to be something that would feels like it really has a place and makes sense like I think if you're playing your tradition, if you're playing the kind of D and D that has been showcased thus far, there's not a lot of place for it. Maybe they do something creative and they make a kind of game, or maybe they they show up with a a campaign that is built around birthright. It. Yeah, maybe they do that. You know, a birthright kind of game that is built around strongholds or their old second edition like castles and crusades and stuff mm -hmm. that you know, where it's it is built around this concept of players running a small domain and uh, going out and doing things from their domain and then returning to their keep at the end of the day. And that could be cool. There's a, you know, kind of like a, what was it? Kingmaker series in the Pathfinder. Yep. yep. That was all about you clearing out a land and, you know, running your, building up your kind of organization. Could be cool, but for most campaigns, meh. Yeah, and then I refer back to the slept on book of Acquisitions Incorporated for that exact very thing. The Bastions don't, I don't think, handle that at all well. It only handles you making a place and having these daily or seven, sorry, these weekly activities occur and getting a very minor benefit, you know, versus like building a corporation and running it from the ground up. Like right. that can it's be at least attributed to, okay, it's not a corporation, it's a kingdom, you know. And well, can... I would look at this as like a like a skeleton. Like this is a basic framework. Yeah. Because it's in the core book. And if they built out like a campaign setting or a specific, you know, adventure, like big book adventure, they would probably build on top of this for yeah. the sake of that campaign or adventure. Like I said, they they did leave a lot of room for that. Um but I I just kind of struggle. It's like that's that's just more work I have to do as a DM. I don't want to do more work. I, I just want to do what I want to do and be done with it and move on to the next thing. Yep. You know? Well, conveniently, you don't ever have to use it. Well, it, it's not, like I said, it, it's definitely not for me. And I, like I said, I don't think it's bad. 
Uh, I think it's relatively good. I think there's a lot of good stuff in there. I think player, so certain players will have fun with it. Um, I just don't think I would have fun with it. Um, I if a if a D, if DM said, "Hey, I want you to build a bastion out," I am. Um, I don't think as a player that it's going to cause me any issues to do that. And there's enough stuff in there that I could at least come up with something. You know, I think the when I was level five, I think there's like a like a a monkey area where you can basically get advantage on saving throws if your player spends yeah. a week in there. You know, I, I can I, role play that fine. Like I know the group of people that I play with. I, I'm gonna be honest. I am probably the only person in our play group who would go nuts over building a keep. Most of my players would not give two shits about it. Yeah. So it, it it's a very specific thing for certain people or or certain campaigns. Yep. Agreed. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, I think that's all. What else is left in the DM's guide that needs to be covered? Because we can um, pro- probably do it next week when Dan's back. There's just the lore glossary. The lore glossary and... Um, the DM screen, which we'll probably yeah, cover. yeah. Let, let's cover it next week once once Dan here. I think Christian, do you have any ecology for this week? Do we want to get into that? Or we... I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's up to you guys. We can wrap it up. We can wrap it up here, or we can. Yeah, we're going pretty long. People are clamoring for ecologies. <laughs> oh, are they? Quick, quick! Give me the ecology for a human. A human? Man, that is that's a whole podcast. Actually, that's a whole lot of podcasts that are already out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it to be human? <laughs> uh, what is a human? Let's start there. Uh, um, yeah, it, we'll, we'll wrap it up here, I think. And, if um, you guys don't have one, I know it's your only job. Oh, we have. I, I, I have. <laughs> I, I have, have an entire. Yeah, we have an. Uh, Christian had an I'm ecology sorry. for last week. It's just do we want to keep yeah. going? So, just all right. You guys want to? Yeah, we, we, no, no, no. We'll do it next week. Everybody, yeah. everybody, tune in for an ecology. Plus, we're going to talk about uh, Earth. Ecology. Earth next <laughs> week. I wanted to talk about it tonight, but Dan's not here, so I figure I'll hold off. Yeah, he is kind of needed with Earth yeah. being. A D and D plane now. I know, right? I, <laughs> I I've I've been spending a lot of time digging into the plane of Earth and the crazy shit that Ed Greenwood has been writing for decades. Not just him. <laughs> oh no, no, he didn't start it. He just continued with it. Yep. Yeah, that, that's definitely Gygax who started this shit. But that'll yep. be next week. Next right. week, stay tuned for Earth and the Ecology of the Gorble. The Gorble, hell yeah! I don't even know what that is. I'm, I'm, I'm look, I'm not looking it up. I want no. to know. I'm not. Well, it's full of hot air. <laughs> awesome. All right, thanks for listening, guys. Bye, Craig. <laughs>